Welcome to Justice Counts, the podcast that goes beyond the law to what's important to you. Equal justice for all is a guidepost for our nation, but how do we achieve that? Here are your hosts, writer-commentator Bob Gaddy and novelist attorney Mark M. Bello. Today we're speaking with Tamina Watson, a Seattle-based immigration attorney whose law firm focuses exclusively on U.S. immigration and naturalization law. Tamina is amazing. She's an experienced and passionate attorney who focuses on employment-based, family-based, and investor immigration law. She hosts a radio show turned podcast, Tamina Talks Immigration, on which she discusses immigration news updates and interviews immigrants and people who are making an impact. She's also the author of the book, The Startup Visa, Key to Job Growth and Economy Prosperity in America, which advocates for a new visa category for entrepreneurs and startup founders. So with that, here's Mark M. Bello to welcome Tamina Watson. Tamina Watson, welcome to Justice Counts. How are you today? I'm well. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored to be here. The honor is all mine. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, immigration is a is a hot topic in America right now. So your presence here, especially in the context of what we do, which is all things justice, uh, I consider immigration to be a, a very important topic about justice in America, not just to Americans, but to people who are either trying to become Americans or are trying to escape uh, bad things happening in, in their own countries. And it, it, it's an issue where, where Americans decide what kind of people they want to be. Uh, do we want to be a compassionate, welcoming country or do we want to be a company that builds walls and slams doors in people's faces? So I'm kind of interested in chatting with you about that. Well, I'm so grateful. I've got a new book coming out, a new Zachary Blake legal thriller coming out called uh, Betrayal at the Border. It's about, in part, the southern border issue. So um, it'll be out in the fall. So your visit's very timely for me. Uh, That's fantastic. We, we should have you on my blog, my podcast too, to talk about that book when it comes out. You got it. I, I, I think that's already scheduled. Uh, dirty, oh, little, dirty little secret between us. But Oh, fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. I love it. Well, get, I can't let, wait to read it. Okay. Let's get right to it, shall we? Mm-hmm. I'd, I'd like to talk to you about the southern border, as I indicated, but a, a side issue, if you will. More importantly, I'm curious about discrimination in general. Hispanics, Asians, Blacks, Jews, Muslims. How does discrimination and white privilege play into our country's immigration policies, do you think? A really, really important question, and thank you for asking. It's very profound and deep, and I'm not sure I can do justice to the answer. Um, What has happened with our laws, and there are so many uh, thought leaders who've talked about this, the laws do reflect some of the institutional or systemic discrimination that we've seen. And when it comes to immigration, I'll take you through a little historic tour of how immigration is today and how it sort of got here. But before I do that, let me just make sure that your listeners know why I'm competent to speak about this. I am an immigrant if they haven't tuned into my accent yet. I moved here from the United Kingdom where I was born and raised, and I was a baby lawyer when I moved here. I was a barrister there, which didn't really mean anything here until George Clooney married one. So I don't have to say I'm a coffee maker. Um, But when I came here and started practicing immigration law, you know, what I I didn't know immigration could be so much more than asylum. In fact, I didn't want to practice immigration because I didn't know it could be so broad. And so a snapshot for your listeners, immigration can be broken down into sort of headings, if you like. There's family-based immigration. That's when um, U.S. citizen uh, parents, spouses, children apply for their immediate relatives. Um, You cannot apply for an aunt. You cannot apply for a grandparent, uh, contrary to what the media made you think in the last few years when the word chain migration took um, you know, a hold of immigration. 
you can only apply for uh, uh, immediate relatives. And uh, for um, there's an employment based heading where you are either investing in this country in your own business or you are um, a genius in your field and you know take that with a grain of salt but somebody who's very successful in their field um, and people who are being sponsored by U.S. businesses uh, and I live in Seattle Washington it's the uh, headquarters of many many global companies that are you know your listeners would know and uh, then there is everything else so you have the refugee criteria you have the humanitarian criteria you have diversity lottery and all of these have visa numbers you know there are set numbers of visas given for each of these sort of headings and so when you think about um, how these laws started they were rooted in 1952 when uh, our immigration reform took a uh, center stage, it was on the heels of um, what happened with the civil rights movement. And again, your discrimination question is so pertinent to how all of this evolved. So in 1952, we had this framework that was based upon family unity. More green cards are given out in the family context. And then in 1965, there were some further changes made to employment based categories. And then 1990 is when we saw some uh, final um, amendments made. Um, but we need to go back in history a little bit more. So when America was founded, at the time, people would get on the boat and somehow get here to Ellis Island. You know, when you hear people say, get in line, we did it the right way. There were no real laws at the time. You get on the boat and you get off. And maybe there was some processing. At that time, uh, this was what, in the 1800s maybe, um, you know, America started to grow. And I would encourage people to read my book called The Startup Visa. There's a chapter in it about a history of how um, immigrants have made contributions, starting from Jamestown, when John Rolfe came with tobacco into the settlements, you know, fleeing persecution to what it is today and how New York became the rising vertical city because Andrew Carnegie had found a way to manufacture cheap steel. You know, all of these things are important to understand because contributions have been made by immigrants throughout the generations. No, no question. Then comes the early... No, no question about that. Then comes the sure. early... Yeah, well, I think that the, the trouble is that, uh, and Bob may face this a lot more from, you know, people forget history, they don't know history, and there's an entitlement that we're here and we don't want anybody else. But people don't realize we all came from somewhere else. So then in the early 1900s, when the East Coast and West Coast were trying to sort of, you know, connect, we needed railroads. When we had these railroad needs, the building needs, immigration laws were expanded some so that we could get the labor to come from Southeast Asia. So we had a lot of Asians come in from the Philippines, China and places like that. When the railroads were connected, suddenly we're facing the Chinese Exclusion Act because we don't want these people anymore. We've already got the work done. So your discrimination question to start with is really important to understand because it's not from today. It's from the when time began. But throughout that, immigration has made, uh, you know, an impact on America, on America's economy, on America's society and, and culture. 1924 comes along, we have a quota then. And we have Eastern Hemisphere, Western Hemisphere. And these have quotas and no quotas for Western Hemisphere. And then comes, you know, quotas in the Immigration Nationality Act. Uh, I think it's 1924. And so all of these things, there is a line that connects between discrimination to what you see today, because the laws were done with these sort of purposes. What I will say is there is a book called the... Um, I will make sure I email it to you. It's written by a New York Times reporter who did a lot, did a lot of investigative journalism to understand how immigration reform happened in 1952, 
And the First World War, the Second World War, all of these played a part in it because obviously politics goes hand in hand with immigration laws. So at the time, we needed to bring refugees and give space for refugees and people who are, you said you were from the Jewish faith, um, uh, Mark, you know, a lot of people in, in your community had faced atrocious uh, and horrific uh, situations in, in, in Germany. We needed a pathway for those to people to come here too. And the immigration reform wrapped around all of those issues because side by side civil rights uh, movement was happening. And so um, it's an important question to ask about discrimination and does it happen today? The answer is yes. Um, but within that, there are good things too. Within the laws that we had, we had amazing people come here and they've made their mark. And, you know, if you think about, I mentioned John Rolfe from the settlement days. I mentioned Andrew Carnegie from the 1900s. But if you move forward and think about the 2000s, we have eBay's founder, SpaceX founder, um, Elon Musk, who's now thinking about taking us to space. Um, and then you think about uh, our today's challenges under Zoom, uh, under COVID. Our Zoom that we are using right now was founded by an immigrant, a Chinese immigrant. Um, the vaccine that is literally saving our lives were co-founded by immigrants. The communication that we do, and a lot of people use WhatsApp, was you know created by co-founders who are immigrants. So whichever era you look at, immigrants have made a contribution and put America on the map. In general, the American people are good people and welcoming people. If there's a disaster anywhere in the world, the American people are the first to help out with, with what's going on. But we do face a situation at the moment because of the div divisiveness in politics when there is a very wide gap between the understanding of what immigration is. And when people say we don't want immigrants, they're not necessarily understanding the contributions that are being made right now right, and right here. And when you say we don't want immigrants, uh, it is affecting us, the consumers, the American businesses, because American businesses are hiring um, you know, immigrants. Immigrants are creating businesses and startups and hiring people. You know, if you think about our education system, there are lots of students who are coming every day. If you think about our healthcare system, look at the, the, the doctors that are saving us today. So no matter which area you look at, oh, I didn't even touch the farming industry. You know, well, during COVID, the only place that we could go during these lockdowns were the grocery stores. How were those shiny apples on the grocery store shelves? It's because some immigrants somewhere picked them. And so it is very important to understand that we are one in many ways, even though it doesn't actually appear so. And discrimination is there visibly and invisibly in many ways, and we do need to tackle them. Well, if you're not a Native American, you're an immigrant. That's right. So many, many of our, of our so-called uh, patriots are children of immigrants themselves. It's, it's, it's kind of a silly argument to, to say we shouldn't be welcoming to immigrants when you were welcomed into this country yourself. But I, I want to talk, if you don't mind, about the southern border and, and what, what many politicians refer to as a crisis do you see the southern border as, as a, a big problem, as a crisis? How do you see what's going on at the southern border right now? You know, the southern border has always been a challenge. It's not a new challenge today. And it stems from the causes that are happening in, in those areas in the, in the southern, um, the, the Latin American countries. And so one of the things that this administration is really trying to focus on are the root causes of why this is happening. And we've seen the VP, the Vice President Kamala Harris, go to um, Honduras and I forget which country she went to, but those countries where she's speaking with the leaders to see how can America help with the solutions within those countries so that people don't make these, tr these treacherous journeys uh, to America to just live. And, it, it, you know, it's a crisis in the sense that people are coming here, and they, but they've always come here. 
One of the things that I want people to understand is the southern border is not everything about immigration. Immigration is a combination of so many things, but the focus being on the southern border takes away attention from everything else that needs it. Right now, for example, I just mentioned to you, there are green card quotas for employment-based and family-based. These numbers get reset on September 30th, actually the start of the fiscal year, October 1. We're about to lose hundreds of thousands of visa numbers because the government has not been able to process them. Uh, and that's, that can be co considered a crisis too, but that doesn't make the news in the same way. So what is being reflected in the news has some impact on how things are portrayed. But the narrative on immigration is we are, we are a welcoming country. We always have been. And I think we are going to have a dark place in history when history demonstrates that we ripped babies apart from their parents, from their mothers, nursing children. That is not who, who we are as a nation. Yet that is going to go down in history. And those a lot of children are still being, you know, reunited. And this administration is making a difference uh, or making an effort to reunite them. But to come back to your original question, what do I think about the border? Yes, it's a problem. But uh, and the solution is not a quick solution. These problems have stemmed for years and decades and it cannot be uh, you know, expected to have a solution overnight. But this administration is taking a creative approach in trying to find solutions. I, I mean, I, I do frequently try to think about what would I do if I were in, the, in those shoes? And I, I don't think the answer is simple at all. But we do need to find ways. Laws are there to be, um, you know, adhered to. And one of the, the, the uh, issues that the, the people on the other side of the fence, so to speak, uh, are I'll talk about is the is security, border security. But a wall would not solve the problem. You know, what we saw in the last four years is an administration that took money from the Treasury to build this wall that really wasn't built, but the money's gone. And uh, even if the sections of the walls that existed, they didn't prevent what they were trying to do. And so, you know, we need to use the modern technologies that we have at our hand to find ways to have effective solutions. And those are the solutions that this administration is trying to do. Amina, uh, I, I understand. I'd like to get into perhaps if you know uh, what some of these solutions are, but um, immigration law is not a, a, a subspecialty of mine. Uh, I didn't practice in that field. I, I don't know much about it, but I do know, for instance, that there's uh, a section of the law that talks about family sponsorship. And my understanding is, and you correct me if I'm wrong, that many of the people that are trying to get into the country already have people, uh, family members who are here, some of whom are already citizens or about to be citizens. Isn't there a way legally through immigration law to allow these people to be released into the custody of those people who are already here? That's a really good question. And that's what I had mentioned right at the beginning about the headings, the family-based immigration and employment-based immigration and everything else. The, the, the people that are coming to the southern border you sort of need to put them in buckets because they go into diff different types of buckets. Uh, some are truly, you know, fleeing for their lives. They've been part of gang violence and many other horrific, you know, uh, situations. And if there are family members, um, yes, they should be. There should be some humane ways of processing. But what we have is a, a system that is broken. In the last four years, we we've had a system that has needed to be reformed for three decades, four decades, because the laws have not, I mentioned 1952, which is a framework, where in 2021, our laws have not been updated since. So we do need- a, In 60 years. Yes, that's, thank you for doing the math for me. So here we are, wow. and <laughs> here we are, and um, the laws do not keep up with things. So when you have all of these people come in, we have to have laws that fit the problem. We don't have that. But let's talk about the system itself. The immigration system, the Department of Homeland Security has three arms. 
the USCIS, the CBP, Customs and Border Protection, and then there's ICE, Immigration Customs Enforcement. Um, USCIS is funded by the fees that they collect from applications that are filed, and CBP and ICE are funded by the government. The USCIS is the one that administers the benefits. In the last four years, the Trump administration's goal was to really break everything down. So they didn't have an, uh, a confirmed leader to direct USCIS. That has only happened in the last week or so. Um, but we've had no, uh, we've just had acting people who are not confirmed, who are really making, you know, very big decisions on how the, the agency would be run. Then we don't, we've had a lot of people, um, I mean, basically, they don't have a lot of staff. And with with these asylum cases, you need staffing uh, to process these cases. But these cases also get processed, processed in immigration court. And if you may remember from the last four years, immigration judges, which is an, um, an arm of the Department of Justice, were being puppeteered to some extent by by the previous administration, something that has never happened before. And as a lawyer, you would appreciate this. The attorney general is mentioned in all statutes. The attorney general has this power and that power. But before the previous administration, that power was used um, very um, uh, sacredly, you know, only when necessary. But what we saw with William Barr and what we saw with Jeff Sessions, they took some of these asylum cases and certified to themselves so that they could create cases that would be precedent setting to make sure that these asylum seekers would not get their benefits. If you are a family member of somebody who's been murdered from a, from a gang, you would now not be able to get asylum, even though your life is at risk. If you've been uh, subject to um, sexual assault, you would not be, you know, you would not necessarily be afforded asylum. And in these countries, you cannot go to the law authorities because often they are conspiring with the perpetrators. And so what we saw is a system that was manipulated with, uh, you know, the, the powers that they had and really, really took, uh, which, you know, was unprecedented. And they had taken systems and policies to make sure the judges' hands were tied. And so they said, you need to, you know, have these many cases a year. This is how you need to, con the judges, the judicial freedom was taken away from them. And so what we have a system that is completely broken in every respect. And this administration has the very, very difficult task of rebuilding things. So, you know, there is frustration within the immigration lawyers community that, you know, things are not happening quick enough. But the problem is so deep and profound. So the answer to your question is absolutely not simple, <laughs> um, but it's a system that needs to be created. Now, access to justice and justice is what you care about and what I care about and Bob cares about. That is what this administration is trying to do with um, creating new pathways to deal with the people that are coming in as families, to get them processed quickly through the immigration court system. And they're trying out new things. And, you know, I commend them for, for trying to be creative. And, you know, it's going to take collaboration from people on the ground and people in the court, the, the lawyers and the social workers and what have you. And we have to see where that goes. But what I will ask your listeners um, to take away from this is collaborate where you can. If justice and human rights is something you care about, we're all part of the solution. Don't sit at the, on the sideline and say, why are you not doing something? The question I throw back to you, just like President Kennedy said, is what are you doing for your country? We're going to pause right here for a message, but when we come back, Tamita Watson will address the issue of the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program, the so-called DREAMers, that uh, President Trump tried to eliminate and kick those people out of this country. So stay tuned.
Thank you so much for asking that very, very important and very timely question. In fact, just last night, the Senate passed a reconciliation bill, which actually has a line item to uh, find a pathway for the undocumented people, including DACA folks. And before I answer your question, I do want to make sure your listeners know that I have a bi-weekly column in a national mag legal magazine called Above the Law. And I write about all these topical things, what I'm seeing on the ground, what impact that's ha ha having, and then what solutions there could be. And one of the articles, the most recent one, was about DACA, and it's a story uh, from one of my clients. You know, to put in context, who are these DACA folks for your listeners in case they don't, they don't know? DACA was created as a program so that children who are brought to the United States, um, people who are brought to the United States as children, um, whether they were uh, just brought over without inspection uh, or they were brought over as children, but they became unlawful afterwards. Uh, they were given protection by President Obama uh, because immigration reform kept failing and the DREAM Act wasn't passing. It was not legal status. It was permission to be here. And that's a very important distinction for people to, to understand. It was permission to be here. They do not have a green card. They do not have citizenship. They simply have permission to be here and work here and live here. What happened under the Trump administration is that he had promised on the campaign trail between 2015 and 16 that he, you know, he gave lots of bad words and name calling to a lot of different communities. And um, Mark had mentioned some of those uh, minority communities right at the outset. He had names for everybody. But one of the things that was part of the rhetoric was to have mass deportation and, you know, take DACA away. And, you know, after the election, a lot of us were told, well, you know, he just said those things to win the election. He's not going to be so bad. But what we saw was things were much worse than we could even have contemplated. And so it was about September 2017 that he actually put pen to paper and rescinded the DACA program. These people were also threatened to be deported because the at the time, the ICE chief said, if DACA is taken away, I will deport them. What was the saving grace were the courts. The courts uh, had litigation that was pending that put a stay on, on the program. And eventually, as you may re remember, the Supreme Court in 2020 said, you know, while the DACA program wasn't, you know, created properly, uh, it was actually, it was properly done, but you didn't undo it properly. Uh, and so the Supreme Court actually created a roadmap for what Trump could do to undo it. They were, it was a technicality on which they said, you know, DACA remains. But it, it did bring a lot of life back into the community and people were uh, allowed to file DACA applications again. What happened recently, Bob, and I'm so glad you brought it up, a judge in Texas said, well, you know, it's unlawful. Therefore, you cannot file. And so the story that I share in Above the Law is for a client who was about to file DACA and was stopped and simply cannot do it at the moment. But right this moment, there is momentum through Congress because there, there are bills that are out there, the DREAM Act, but also the reconciliation bill as of today the, the, for, for the budget uh, is going to address this issue. And I think if your listeners and you are interested, keep a very close eye on the news about what that means. Okay. And Bob, I would love for you to continue reporting on it in your not fake news blog, because people, it's very, very important for people to understand the truth of the matter and what is going on. Well, you can be sure that we'll do that. Um, is the reconciliation bill that you're talking about, the $3.5 trillion uh, bill that the, that the Democrats are probably going to have to pass on their own in the Senate, is that the one you're talking about? I believe, I, I'm, I'm not sure how much money. I, I feel as though 3.5 trillion was part of the infrastructure bill. And I don't know if that, I don't know if that. Oh, it's the, not the same. Okay. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. That it was a budget resolution that needs to be passed. And I, I think they might be two different things. I'm not 100% sure. I understand. I understand. But the bottom line is that these DACA folks have made a huge contribution to this country in this in these past years that they've been here 
Yes, they're they're in the medical field. I mean, you think about the you you think about our society, and if you didn't have to think about somebody's status, people who are hardworking are making a contribution, and to these people, they know nothing else. Some of them were brought. I mean, the 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 story that I share, my client was like just a few months old. She doesn't know a different country. She doesn't know the language of a, of a different country. And all of these millions of people who were brought here as children, America is their home. They love it and they are all but citizens. And if we are able to give them a path to citizenship, they will contribute even more because they have the freedom to reach their potential and their potential will also mean America's benefiting. It's, it's a win-win for all. But you know, in addition to the ec- economic argument for doing this, there's a humanitarian argument, there's a moral argument. And it's just what Mark said right at the outset, who do we want to be as a nation? Exactly, why would you send back to a country individuals who, really have never been there. I mean, I have two friends. One is the manager of a restaurant here in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. He is a dreamer. He's been here since he was about three. Uh, I have another friend who built my patio. He's a brilliant- brilliant I wanna wanna see your patio before you- Before Um, before we pass judgment on this guy, I wanna see your patio. (laughs) I'd be happy to. Uh, he, he, uh, he, uh, he, he just does brilliant work. But aside from that, these two individuals are the hardest working people I have ever run across. Well, I want to, I want to, I want to take that one step further though. I, I will. As a country, we train these people to be the best they can be. And then we send them elsewhere with that education. That's stupid. Aside from being selfish, it's stupid. Why would we why would we train a person who might have a cure for cancer and send him back to some other country? And that's been happening. You know, um, my book called The Startup Visa was first published in 2015. And at the time, I had the incredible honor of uh, a foreword being that was written by an academic and an entrepreneur whose name is Vivek Wadhwa. And Vivek Wadhwa is uh, an incredibly um, uh, profound name in the world of entrepreneurship and thought leadership. He wrote a book called The Brain Drain. Oh, no, The um, Immigrant Exodus, where he coined the term brain drain. And what he was saying, and this was, you know, a decade ago, that he was seeing that these people that you mentioned, Mark, who we were educating here, They couldn't stay here because of the immigration barriers. And they were going back to India, China, wherever, and they were creating the competitor to Amazon. They they were creating the competitor to other, you know, um, big names that we have. And they're employing local people and they are generating revenue right there. And they're actually doing so well with with technology, the the level, the game, the playing field has been leveled in many, many ways, because you can have a computer on a beach on Bali and continue to manage a business and clientele and, you know, remote workers from there and make millions. And that is, in fact, what is happening. And COVID really exposed that very, very clearly that you can be anywhere in the world and be an employee. And a lot of Americans have been working outside and a lot of immigrants who are, have been here suddenly think, you know, you know, maybe I'll just live in Costa Rica for a bit and come back. And they have been doing that, the immigration challenges with that too. But you've, you've hit the, you, you, you're spot on, Mark, because that's exactly what is happening. And if these people are given the opportunity to come here, they will, the immigrants are, prone to entrepreneurship because they know they have no choice but to work hard and it's within their DNA. I would uh, invite your listeners to listen to my podcast series that is ongoing at the moment called The Startup Visa, which goes hand in hand with the book. The book came out July 20th and the podcast series, the, the last episode will air this week or next week. But every single person that is on that series um, 
has an awful lot to say about this. And one of them is the founder of an organization called Startup Without Borders. Her name is Valentina Primo, and she is based in Europe, dealing with immigrant refugees in the Middle East. You should listen to what she has to say about immigrant and immigrant contributions wherever they are in the world. And they are dynamic people making a difference right there wherever they are. They don't have to be in America. But most people want to be in America because if you can make it here with a business, a startup, you can make it anywhere in the world, generally speaking. Your consumer base is here, your resources here, the investors that are innovative and supportive and encouraging of newfound ideas are here in America. So people want to be here, but we're not letting them. Therefore, it's a boon for Canada. Canada created a startup visa uh, using our first bill, and they are up and running with it. They have created jobs. They, they are attracting the talent that we should have here. Um, and so it comes back to the profound sentence that you uh, had mentioned at the outset. What is the nation that we want to be? I'm kind of pessimistic about all this, but uh, what do, you, do you see a positive future? How do we make things better? You know, I'm an optimist. I think if you don't have hope, you can't move forward. And I've seen a lot of darkness firsthand through the last four years. But I didn't lose hope because among the people that are trying to uh, cause harm and, you know, whatever reason they have, there are a lot of good people out there. And I will invite your listeners to read my book, The 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 legal heroes in the Trump era, because it's a story of what I had done, but also what a, an example, a sample lawyer group had done, 14 lawyers that I knew, including the Washington State Attorney General who fought the first travel ban and won. Um, there are a lot of great people in this country with amazing hearts. No if we could collaborate, if we could really change the narrative on immigration and so many other things, healthcare, you know, I mean, you name it, we have to fix it. But it comes with all of us coming together. You know, it's it's amazing that we have great leadership. You know, the interior department is led by a Native American. That has never happened before. We are getting great leaders into the spots they need to be. But as citizens of a country, we cannot then just put our you know arms up and say, you know, we've got leaders in place. Leaders can lead, but we have to be part of the solution too. So what does the future look like? We have good people. It would be great for them all to rise together so that we can be the country that we want it to be for us, for our children, our grandchildren for years to come. Amen. Tamina for president. <laughs> I wasn't born here. So the birth <laughs> story would really be a problem. <laughs> Tamina, I ask this of all my guests. What, what does the word justice mean to you? Justice means being fair and reasonable to every human being and every every being. Great answer. Thank you for being our guest. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored. I cannot wait to chat about your book about the border soon. And I cannot wait for listeners to listen to our conversation. Thank you. I'm, ex I'm excited. Tamina, thanks for joining us today on Justice Counts. It was an incredibly informative and fascinating conversation. And Mark Bellow and I are grateful and thanks everyone for listening. The immigration issue is going to be with us for a long time, I'm afraid, and it's great to have smart, knowledgeable people like Tamina Watson out there representing those who need help and doing good work. Meanwhile, if you haven't done so already, please check out Mark Bellows' Rip from the Headlines legal thrillers, all available at Amazon and other major online booksellers. He has quite the hero in attorney Zachary Blake, who fights for justice on all fronts. His books are Betrayal of Faith, Betrayal of Justice, Betrayal in Blue, Betrayal in Black, Betrayal High, Supreme Betrayal, and just out, Betrayal at the Border. For more information, just check markmbello.com. Until next time, this is Bob Gaddy from Mark Bello signing off for Justice Counts.